Hey, good morning, physics. How are you? Actually, it's probably evening when you're watching this, but it's morning for me. So uh, welcome to another flipped lecture. We are going to be looking at uh, real-world oscillations here. What we did last week is kind of idealized. We ignored friction and various things like that. This week, we're going to look at how it actually happens when you have simple harmonic motion and uh, some examples of that in the real world. So we're in Chapter 12 still, Sections C and D. And let's dive right into it. So uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is damping. So damping means uh, shutting down something. There are air dampers in a air conditioning system that like slow the flow in a particular direction, or you have a damping pedal on a piano. Same idea where you slow down the vibrations of the string. Uh, to damp something means to slow it down. So damping of oscillations means to slow down the oscillation. It means particularly to lessen the amplitude of the oscillations, okay? Um, so damping is, uh, is some kind of frictional force. It has to do with the medium that the oscillation is going through. So an oscillation in air has a particular damping force. An oscillation under water has a much greater damping force. An oscillation in like motor oil or syrup would have an even greater damping force. And so the damping force has to do with the thickness or the viscosity of the medium that it's going through. And the equation there is that the force of damping is equal to negative beta, and beta is the friction coefficient in the medium, okay, times the velocity of the, uh, of the oscillation. So the faster it's oscillating, the greater the friction force on it, and the greater that the force is trying to work to slow it down. So it looks very much like the regular equation for friction, the uh, F equals mu N, um, but instead of mu, we use beta, um, and uh, beta just lets us know that the friction force we're talking about is an oscillation in a medium. And then we use the, uh, the velocity here instead of a normal force because we're not necessarily talking about weight and, and gravity and things of that nature. Um, notice that it is negative because the friction force is always in the opposite direction of the oscillation. So if something is oscillating up, the friction force is pushing down on it. And if something is oscillating down, the friction force is pushing up on it. So um, it's always trying to do the opposite things of the oscillation, which is why it lessens the amplitude and eventually stops the oscillation. Okay, so um, some terms here. If we have so much viscosity, so much uh, damping force that we can't do anything else but just get back to equilibrium, then that's called overdamped. There's no oscillation at all. You put a string, uh, sorry, a spring with a weight on it in, in uh, like lard and you pack it all in lard and you pull the string, you let it, the spring and you let it go, the weight's going to go up, but it's just going to go back to equilibrium and stop because it's way too thick to move anywhere else. That's overdamped. Critically damped is when the, the viscosity is such that the, the system will return just past equilibrium and then settle. That is, uh, that's critically damped. And then anything less than that, you're going to get some oscillation um, as it as it the system will move a little bit before it settles down to equilibrium um, and you could take that logically to as far out as you can with a vacuum and say well if there's no medium if you're doing this in an evacuated chamber then there's going to be very little damping matter of fact the only damping that there will be is the force of friction inside the spring itself as the molecules move past each other so um, in that case, you'd have an oscillation that would last a really long time, but it would still eventually stop because there is friction within the molecules of the spring. So everything is damped a little bit. Um, some things are damped a whole lot, and uh, we've got some vocabulary there for you. So uh, here's some pictures. This is just a damped system. You can see that the time interval doesn't change, right? The frequency doesn't change. This is all the same frequency, right? What's changing is the amplitude. So it's not that the oscillations get closer together or, or further apart. It's just that the amplitude shrinks. This is a damped system. Overdamped would be it takes a long time to just return to equilibrium. Critically damped is it gets to equilibrium and it may overshoot just a touch and then it sits there. And then any other kind of damping will allow some oscillation to go. Okay. That's damping. The opposite of damping is driving an oscillation. And a, a driven oscillation is when you push on the oscillation at the peak 
to give it a little bit more energy. And if you always push on the oscillation just a little bit at the peak of the amplitude, then you're going to give a little more energy to the next oscillation. And that's going to help overcome any damping forces. So if there's just a little bit of friction on a system and you can tap, tap, tap as it's doing this, then you will overcome the damping force and the oscillation can, in fact, go on forever. Um, that's kind of the idea of a pendular clock. Uh, you do still have to wind it up, but that's because you're adding energy to a spring, and the spring just barely taps the pendulum to keep the pendulum swinging, well, forever, so that the clock keeps time. And as long as you wind up the spring to add more energy to that tap, 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 your clock keeps running. My grandfather had a grandfather clock, and it ran uh, most of his life. Um, sitting in the living room. Well, I should say most of my life that I saw his. Uh, sitting in his living room, he had this clock going all the time, and he would wind it every morning, and it would uh, it would keep great time. So that's the uh, that's the idea there. Just a little bit of an impulse every peak will keep an oscillation going if you can overcome the damping forces. Okay, um, the if you tap it on the peaks of the oscillation harder than you need to to overcome the the damping forces, then you're not just keeping the oscillation going, you're actually driving the oscillation to greater amplitude. Um, and that's called a drivel, driven oscillation. They can be good or they can be bad, and I'll show you pictures of both. So good first. Um, here's a, an example where you drive the oscillation at every peak, you add a little more energy. And so the amplitude gets bigger and bigger. Now notice the frequency is not changing, it's just the amplitude that's changing, okay? Um, and a picture of that is taking a kid out and swinging at the park. If they say, push me, push me, push me, and you push just enough to overcome the friction in the chain and the wind resistance, then the, uh, the child would keep swinging at the same height. But eventually a kid will say, push me higher, and then you give them a good shove, and you have driven their oscillation. They're going to go higher because of your great push. Now, you don't want to push so hard that they go wrapped around <laughs> the pole. That would be bad. But... Um, but pushing them harder makes them go higher, right? And so that is the, the idea there of a good driven oscillation. Now here's a bad driven oscillation. This is the Tampa Narrows Bridge, and it famously collapsed in 1940 because uh, it got wind forces on it just right to start this kind of, it's called a torsion wave, and the, the bridge was dancing because of the wind, and the wind was of the right speed and at the right direction to drive the oscillation so that the uh, oscillation got stronger and stronger and stronger. And after 40 minutes of this, the bridge collapsed. So there's a little video that somebody took while the bridge was dancing, and you got to know that the person was aware that this wasn't going to be able to last very long. Notice there's no cars on it. Nobody would be foolish enough to drive across the thing at this point. But after 40 minutes of this wind, uh, the bridge collapsed. The bridge had only been up for six months, so uh, the engineer who designed this thing, I'm sure, didn't have a job much longer. Um, but six months after it was built, sorry, uh, the thing came down in a windstorm. There is a new Tacoma Narrows Bridge that has been designed to withstand wind shear forces and not develop these kinds of waves, and if you're ever up in Tacoma, Washington, you can drive across it with confidence. But this one was taken down by a windstorm. Okay, it's an example of a driven oscillation. Waves. Uh, waves, there's two kinds. There are transverse waves. Transverse waves go up and down. And the definition of a transverse wave is an oscillation 90 degrees from the axis of travel. So if the wave is going this way, the oscillations are going like this, right? They are going up and down, um, and the 90 degrees oscillation versus the axis of travel. Um, a longitudinal wave has oscillations along the axis of travel. And you had this already in physical science, so I'm going kind of quick here because this should be remember, not learn. Um, longitudinal wave, the energy goes forward and then it like stops and then it goes forward again. And that uh, there's no up and down, there's just push, push. It's kind of like cars and traffic on the freeway where you stop and then you can go and then you have to stop. And then you can go and then you can stop. And if you looked at that from the air, you would see areas where there are a whole bunch of cars bunched together and then places where the cars are more spread out. Um, and that's a longitudinal wave. Those places where the molecules of the medium are pressed together or the cars are close together in traffic would be areas of compression. And then the areas where the molecules are more spread out or the cars have some room to go 
are areas of rarefaction. Um, and both of these are waves, and you can see natural examples of both of these, okay? Compression and rarefaction, or in the uh, transverse waves, we call them crests and troughs. It's the same idea, energy moving through the medium. Now, some terms. Wavelength, we use the, uh, Greek, uh, the Greek's letter lambda for this. Lambda is the distance from one crest to the other, or if you're talking about longitudinal waves, it's the, it's the distance from one area of compression to another, okay? Um, and the wave speed is how fast the disturbance is moving through the medium. Oh, look, the medium it's left. It's itself. Ah, that caught that on film. The medium itself moves very little. So if you're sitting in the ocean and waves come past you, you know that it's not all water that's like moving along the ocean. It's energy moving through water. If you were to place a cork on, on the water so it floated on the surface of the water and a wave came by, the cork would go up and down, but the cork would not do a whole lot of left and right um, because the water that it's in just basically responded to the energy, but it didn't actually travel much. Now, when you get to the shore, the water travels because the energy throws the water onto the beach. But as long as you're not after the wave has broken, if you're back in the deeper part of the water, um, the water just moves up and down, okay? So uh, we talk about wave speed as the speed of the disturbance or the speed of the energy, not necessarily the medium, okay? And we have an equation here where wave speed is a function of lambda, the wavelength, and the frequency of the wave. So as the frequency of the wave and the wavelength um, are multiplied together, that gives you a sense of the speed of the energy in the wave, okay? Some pictures, oh, just kidding, not yet. Um, sound is a wave, and uh, no, I'm lost, now I'm found. There you go, praise the Lord. Um, these are pictures I wanted to show you now. Um, so a, a wave here, this is a transverse wave, it goes up and down, right? And this is the axis of travel, and this is the axis of oscillation. The distance from the equilibrium point to the crest is the same as the distance from the equilibrium point to a trough. That's the amplitude, okay? These are crests, these are troughs. The wavelength would be any uh, measurement from one point in a wave to the same point in the next wave. So this is as it rises past the equilibrium point to the next time it rises past the equilibrium point. It's usually measured crest to crest or trough to trough, but it'll give you the same measurement no matter how you do that, okay? In a, um, in a wave like this, as we said, the medium does not move, just the energy. So as two kids are whipping a rope back and forth here, this one says, the wave transfers energy down the rope. And this person says, but your hand stays over there and my hand stays over here. So the rope itself is not moving. It's just the energy moving through the rope. Um, and it's the same way through uh, any medium, right? This is a longitudinal wave. We have areas of compression, areas of rarefaction, and a wavelength is compression to compression, okay? And this is the energy moving through a medium in this way. Sound is that kind of wave right? Sound is a longitudinal wave. Um, and so what you hear as sound is determined by lots of factors. And again, then you had this in physical science. So the intensity or the loudness of a, of a sound is the square of its amplitude. So the, the higher the amplitude or the greater the degree of crunch uh, versus rarefaction, the louder it sounds to you. And it is the square of the amplitude that controls the, the loudness or the intensity of the sound. The pitch is the frequency. So the closer together the peaks are, the closer together the compression zones are, the higher the sound your brain interprets. Um, quality is the presence of particular harmonics above the fundamental. Again, you had those terms in physical science. So the fundamental pitch is the, um, the frequency of the note that you hear. So if you hear a flute play middle C or a piano play middle C or an oboe play middle C, they all have the same fundamental vibration. They're all producing the same amount of areas of compression per second. But um, the flute and the oboe and the piano and the clarinet will all sound different to you. You can tell that they're not the same instrument. And that's because beyond just the simple oscillation at that frequency to be middle C, they're producing other waves as well called harmonics. And it's the presence of those other harmonics in the sound that make the flute and the oboe and the clarinet and piano sound different to your ear.
Okay. Lastly, with sound, we have to talk about the Doppler effect. You've heard this many times. Uh, every time a siren passes, you get to experience it. As the, if there is relative motion between the observer, you hearing the sound, and the object making the sound, then the pitch will rise and fall with, re, with uh, relationship to that relative motion. So as the two objects get closer together, the pitch tends to go up. And it, it's actually the same sound, but you're moving closer to the object making the sound. And so you hear the compression waves not only as often as they should be because of the pitch, but you're hearing them faster because you're coming upon them as they're coming upon you. Um, and so the pitch goes up. And the same is true as the object moves away from you. They're still coming at you at the same speed, but you're running away from them. So they have to like chase after you. And so um, you hear them less frequently and the pitch tends to drop. Okay, so some pictures about this and then we will be done. Um, sound waves, remember, are longitudinal waves. They are compression waves. So as the dog barks, he's making areas in the air that are compressed and areas in the air that are less compressed. And those are the sound waves that make it to your ear and you say, oh, cute puppy or darn dog, shut up your dog. One of the two things, uh, depending on your disposition towards the dog. Um, and the higher the pitch, like this piccolo, is going to have a faster frequency, a medium pitch like this saxophone, a lower frequency. There's fewer crests or fewer compressions per second. And uh, this double bass is going to make a lower note and that's going to be represented by fewer compressions per second. So the higher the frequency, the higher the perceived sound. Okay, This is what I was talking about with fundamentals and harmonics. If this is the fundamental wave, uh, the first harmonic is a wave that has exactly half the wavelength, or you could say exactly twice the frequency. right? Um, and so the, the second harmonic would be two crests in the space of one crest, right? And two or two troughs in the space of one trough, it's, it's getting faster still. And it's the combination of these as, as a fundamental wave, it's added to harmonic waves that make the waveforms of various instruments. So a clarinet produces this waveform. And you can see here, the, the crest lines up with the trumpet and the next major crest lines up with the trumpet, and the next major crest lines up with the trumpet. So the clarinet and the trumpet are actually playing the same note. Main crest, main crest, main crest. It's all the squiggles in between that represent harmonics that have been added to the fundamental pitch that make the clarinet sound different than the trumpet. The clarinet is a more complicated sound than the trumpet, um, and uh, both of these are more complicated than the piano, which tends to be uh, one of the simpler wave. And so um, as you hear a clarinet and the trumpet sound different, it's because of the different harmonics that have been added to the fundamental pitch. All righty, a lot of information there in 18 minutes. If you have any questions, please, po please post them in the comments field below, and I will address them as soon as I can. I'll see you tomorrow. God bless you. Have a wonderful evening.